Hello everyone and welcome back to the Library of the Weird. So first of all, I'm really, really sorry for being absent for the last three or four weeks. I've had a pretty serious cold and I couldn't really talk for long amounts of time and my nose was blocked. So like talking would have sounded really, really weird, but I have recovered and now I'm hopefully back to uploading regularly. And today we are continuing our coverage of the Bram Stoker Awards 2023, which will be announced this week, I believe. I think it's on June 17th, but I have to look that up again. And today we're talking about Into the Forest, Tales of the Baba Yaga. Into the Forest is a short story collection or an anthology edited by Lindy Ryan. Um, it was released in November 2022 by Blackspot Books and it is nominated for Best Horror Anthology for the Bram Stoker Awards. This book is about 250 pages long, contains 23 short stories. Um, it also contains an introduction by Christina Henry and it actually starts with a poem by Stephanie M. Whitwich. Other contributors for this book include uh, Gwendolyn Kirste, Lisa Quigley, and Donna Lynch, who some of you maybe have heard of. And if you're wondering, yes, this is a female-only short story collection. And this is mainly because there is a huge... Um, focus on feminism in these stories. The stories in here all kind of merge folklore, horror and feminism, which is really, really interesting. And the stories in here are not retellings or as far as I know, there's no retellings in here. All of these are original stories, um, all of which, as the name of the book suggests, um, all of which kind of focus on the Slavic witch figure Baba Yaga. If you don't know anything about Baba Yaga or maybe only have heard the name but no, don't know anything further, uh, like I said, she's a witch figure in Slavic folklore, which means um, kind of Eastern Europe and Russia. Baba Yaga is often described as an elderly, really ugly woman um, with kind of big teeth. Uh, sometimes even, I think sometimes she's even described with tusks. She's not using a broom to, to ride. She's using a mortar. She lives in a house uh, that can walk uh, and it walks on chicken legs. You can see the house on, on the cover of this book. I think this artwork is really, really beautiful. Um, Baba Yaga in most stories, Baba Yaga eats humans, mostly children. Um, she knows a lot of stuff about herbs, about alchemy and stuff like that. So people come to her to seek remedies, for example. But if you want to visit her and you're okay with seeing uh, the, the house on chicken legs, you will also see a fence which is stuck, uh, decorated with skulls and bones and stuff like that. So she's a really, really ambivalent figure. Um, sometimes she's only described as one of three sisters, but most of the time it's just Baba Yaga. I don't know how famous the Baba Yaga is in the US, for example, but here in uh, Germany and especially in Eastern Germany, I think, um, there are some famous Soviet movies about Baba Yaga, which are actually quite funny. Um, here's a picture of Baba Yaga. She's played by a man, which is kind of strange, but it still works. 
Uh, one famous story about Baba Yaga, which is also in the introduction of this book and um, tells you a lot about the, what kind of character Baba Yaga is, is the following. Um, a daughter or maybe a stepdaughter, I don't really remember, sent into the forest and she meets Baba Yaga and Baba Yaga takes her in. She takes her into her house and she gives her tasks to complete and she couldn't possibly complete these tasks alone. But Baba Yaga says, when I come back, you have to have finished these tasks. And she's helped by mice because she is such a nice person. And yeah, the mice help her complete these tasks. And Baba Yaga gives her riches. And um, she gets back to her mother or stepmother uh, who gets really, really jealous and tells her other daughter, now you go to Baba Yaga, I want you to have these riches as well. And the daughter is a really, really bad, kind of evil character. Um, she's ungrateful, she's jealous, or she has all those bad characteristics. And of course, the mice don't help her. And she doesn't complete the tasks uh, in time. Um, and when Baba Yaga gets back, she kills her, eats her, and decorates her house with the bones. And this is something that uh, that you see again and again in the tales of Baba Yaga, um, where she rewards good people, but uh, kind of punishes bad people. This short story collection kind of use all of this through feminist eyes and this kind of works because Baba Yaga is a woman who lives alone in the forest who only has her house and maybe her mice and stuff like that to keep her company she doesn't need a man and I think this really works well uh, if you want to see her stories through the uh, feminist viewpoint and this is also one big theme of of this book as a whole, many stories deal with how women are treated that are different, that don't fit the norm society wants to put them in. There's, for example, one story called Herald the Night, where Baba Yaga is a young, uh, is a young woman. Um, she's unmarried, which uh, really uh, makes her father uncomfortable. Um, he says, you really need to marry. You have like, you, ha you have the eyes of a man, act more like a woman. And she kind of works as, uh, the village's healer. She knows a lot about herbs. Um, but w at one point, a man comes to her and says, Hey, my wife came to you with child and she came back, um, and she was no longer pregnant. And, He's really angry about that and he tries to hurt Baba Yaga who runs back to the forest and the forest defends her. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, very good story. I really liked it. But there are also stories that really show Baba Yaga's cruelty. There's one story called The Peddler's Promise where Baba Yaga gifts uh, small boxes to the children of a village and says like... Um, the one thing you wish the most is in this box and all the boys open the box and kind of go missing, but all the girls cannot open the boxes. And later it is revealed that Baba Yaga has eaten all of the boys. And the moral of the story, I think is kind of like, no one will just gift you the thing that you want the most. And I really like that story as well, um, although it's really, really cruel. And other stories I really did like are, for example, Fair Trade by Jacqueline West, um, where there's another um, theme which comes, uh, comes up again and again in this novel, uh, in this book. And this is the theme of balance in the story... Uh, woman or a girl is fated to die and she meets Baba Yaga uh, who kind of says well I can change it and 
as you probably can imagine, there is a horrible trade going on. Another great story is called Stalk Bites, written by Evie Knight. Um, it's about abortion, and this is, I think, the only story where Baba Yaga is um, only one of three sisters. And those three sisters kind of run an abortion clinic. And uh, it's what's happening there is really, really horrifying, but um, I really enjoyed the story. And the last story I want to talk about is um, called Water Like Broken Glass by Karina Bissett. And I like this story because it doesn't only concern Baba Yaga, but it also uh, features other prominent um, creatures of Slavic mythology. There's uh, something called a uh, water mite, which is kind of a creature or a woman most of the time uh, that has drowned and is bound to the place where she drowned. And I really enjoyed this one. Most of the stories in here are set in the past and um, in in probably somewhere in Eastern Europe. Um, but there are also some stories um, which take place in the, in the present time. And this basically brings me to what I criticize about this book or maybe more about um, some stories in this book. If you've followed this channel a bit, you probably know that I'm very much into history. I really do like historic stuff. And what I really, really don't like, there's a few stories in here that don't care one bit about um, historical accuracy. There are basically two um, different kinds of um, situations where you notice this. One of them is names. If I have a story that takes place in Eastern Europe or Russia and takes place in the medieval times or like the, the early modern times, um, there are a ton of names you can use. But what you shouldn't do is use some weird English or American Disney names. And this happens in at least one story, maybe two. Um, and I, I really, really do hate that. I, uh, I don't like that one bit. And there are other stories that really, really um, do that nicely. I believe it's um, fair trade where we have names like Marina, Leo, Alexander, which are all Slavic or, or at least Russian names. And this works really, really great. And I don't know why people, why, why writers won't do this bit of, uh, this little bit of research because it's, it's really easy and I just don't get it. I don't know if they think, oh, uh, Russian names sound really weird. I don't want weird names in my story. Um, yeah, I don't know. And the other situation where I notice stuff like that is when writers use like anachronistic writing. And what I mean by that is that they would use phrases um, that have a modern day uh, meaning um, that either have a completely different meaning in the past or are just inventions of the modern age and there's no and, and phrases like that didn't exist in the past for example there's one story where the term red flag is used and it is very much used in the modern context and I, I mean, I haven't re researched this, but I pretty much believe that this is a thing, mm -hmm. a, a modern invention. I don't think people in the 18th century um, would uh, talk about a red flag in this context. There are some stories that uh, fall prey to that, like, uh, and this really takes me out of the story. Um, I mean, there is there is a story where. Um, both of these uh, situations happen. Like the, 
the characters have weird Disney names and they use uh, terms people uh, at that time wouldn't have used. And I still like the story. It's just something that really irks me. One other criticism about this book, um, which is minor, but if you have a book that deals with a character of Slavic, um, Slavic origin, why don't you have writers that are Slavic? I mean, there's probably some that have some some uh, there that have some Slavic blood or something like that. But I've read through the author biographies that are in this book, and there's no Eastern European or Russian writer in there. You wouldn't do that with an anthology um, that covers themes from like Native American mythology or like African themes and stuff like that. So why would you do that with uh, an Eastern Europe folk figure? Um, I mean, I know it's pretty minor, but I looked into that. Um, maybe I'm wrong about this, but uh, I noticed it. And yeah, this is a, is a minor criticism. And you may have noticed, by the way, I talked about this book that I really enjoyed it. I like most of the stories. I think this anthology has a decent chance on winning the award. I will be talking, I think, two weeks from now about another short story collection which probably has even a better um, chance at winning but I guess we'll see this week who of those wins. Next week I'll be talking about The Fervor by Aima Katsu which is nominated for Best Novel and I hope I see you then. Until then, goodbye.